Well, good morning. It is so good to be here with you at Calvary. Thank you so much for welcoming us and just allowing us to be here on this Father's Day. Happy Dad's Day to all the dads. So awesome. I, I want to very quickly uh, introduce uh, my girlfriend. Um, this August, we'll have been married 41 years, and um, uh, it's the longest I've dated anyone. So it's great. Uh, we, we do have, so Kim, just give the little princess wave. There she is right over there. There's my wife, Kim. Um, so we do have four kids, and we just um, celebrated our ninth grandchild, uh, six weeks old. So we have a baseball team now, so that's great. And, um, but we're just enjoying life. We're in a good season. How many grandparents in the house? Any grandparents in the house? Yeah, wow, several. Grandparents, aren't you glad that, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, here's the deal with grandparenting. It's the reward for not killing your own, right? I mean, isn't that great? Uh, so anyway, it's just great to be here with you. Uh, and, and hey, happy Father's Day. What would Father's Day be without a couple dad jokes? So I got a couple dad jokes. Are you ready for some dad jokes? Yes? Okay, so just a couple here. Here we go. So it's, I asked my date to meet me at the gym, but she never showed up. I guess the two of us just aren't going to work out. Hey, I don't need any moans. These are free, okay? So there's no moans allowed in dad jokes, all right? Um, if prisoners could take their own mug shots, they'd be called selfies. C-E-L-L. -L. Try and catch up. All right, all right, here we go. One more. Uh, I used to hate facial hair, but then it grew on me. Okay, all right. I don't know what, what happened. I mean, you know, it, I like them. Anyway, I was 10 years old, and I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was uh, with a couple of my friends. We were going to one of my friend's apartment swimming pools to go swimming, sunny afternoon, and, and I don't know why I had forgotten this small detail. I'm walking with my friends, and all of a sudden I realize I don't know how to swim. I don't know how to swim. And so I tell my friends, guys, listen, hey, I don't know how to swim. And they're like, ah, you're just kidding, you're just kidding. I said, no, seriously, I don't know how to swim. And they kept, they didn't believe me. And they, no, you know how to swim, to the point that I set my towel down by the pool, and they pushed me in the deep end. And I literally, I don't know if you've ever heard the, the accounts where you go down three times and you don't come back up. I remember that. I remember going down the first time and coming back up, grabbing some air, going down the second time, coming back up, grabbing some air, and going down the third time. And that was it. I remember that distinctly. And then the last thing I remember was there was this arm that came down and grabbed me and pulled me out. It just so happens that there happened to be a father there with his family, just a, 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 a relaxing time at the pool when he happened to see this and he pulled me out. Otherwise, I would have drowned. I would not be here today if it weren't for a father who reached down and grabbed me out of the pool. And aren't you glad for a heavenly father who grabbed us out of the midst of all of our sin and chaos and pulled us out of that and said, I want to be your father. See, I understand that. I understand that. And I'm so grateful for the dads in the house. And I want to jump right into the message today because it, I think it relates, but it's going to maybe a little bit of a different twist for many of us when we think about Father's Day and also, if you would, open your Bibles or look, take notes or whatever. But let's look at Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 1, and it simply says this, uh, seeing the crowds, or one day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Now this is the Sermon on the Mount. Many of us are familiar with these three chapters, 5, 6, and 7. So Jesus is there. He's, he's going to come. He's going to teach the people. That's very important we understand that he's there to teach the people. So here's a picture of the Mount of Beatitudes here where this took place. You can see the Sea of Galilee in the background. There's, that slope there is a lot uh, larger than it looks on the picture there. But the people started gathering. So you can imagine, if you will, on this nice afternoon that people start gathering from all over. They're, they're coming. Hey, there's this Jesus guy. He's in town. Let's go see him. Let's go hear him. And they've got their blankets and they've got their picnic lunches filled with manna and they've got all the stuff there that are there to hear Jesus speak, right? And they see their friends. Hi. Oh, we missed you in synagogue last week. Oh, yeah, I know. We were out. We didn't get a chance to make it. But we watched it on B-Tube. It was before YouTube started. And so we watched it on B-Tube and there we saw our favorite rabbi speak. Oh, but we miss having you in synagogue each week. And they're just talking and all this and all of a sudden Jesus sits down and everyone's quiet and he starts to teach 
And one of the things that he taught is in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9. You'll look at it with me if you would. It says, pray like this. Now stop and understand that Jesus is still teaching. He didn't stop to pray this prayer. He's teaching this prayer. So watch what he says. He says, pray like this, our Father in heaven. May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And so the idea is, is that Jesus is teaching the disciples and all the crowd that is gathered there how to pray. And he talks about a lot of different things in ch- chapters 5, 6, and 7. But it's important for us to just kind of hone in for just a moment on this one idea that Jesus is teaching the the crowd about, and that's this idea of prayer. But there's more to it than just teaching about prayer. We want to get into it. Now, I don't know if you're a movie person. I like movies, and in a a good movie, they they change scenes from different scenes to different scenes. So we're going to do that today a little bit. So we're going to make a scene change for just a moment. So in the course of following Jesus, here's the scene change. In the course of following Jesus, the disciples noticed that each time Jesus returned from a time of prayer, remarkable things happened. There was miraculous things that happened after Jesus came back from prayer. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus hears of his cousin John the Baptist being beheaded and being killed. And so what happens, let's look at it in verse 13 of chapter 14. It says this, as soon as Jesus heard the news about his cousin, he left in a boat to a remote place to be alone. I want you to understand that this right here, it, there's a lot of emotion in this book. We don't often, we don't often get this. We, t- we tend to just kind of read through the words on the pages, and we forget that these are real people with real emotions and real lives. And Jesus, fully, fully in his humanity state, he, he wept, he cried, he, he, he was broken over the fact that his cousin had just been killed. He said, I got to be alone. And I love this because it shows us a real Jesus with real feelings and real emotions in his life and how much more he cares for us in the same way. And he goes away, but if you read the rest of of, uh, Matthew chapter 14, watch what happens after Jesus comes from being alone with his father. A large crowd gathers upon the return of Jesus, and here's what happens. He heals all who are sick. He feeds a crowd of 5,000. He walks on water. When he gets to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, people simply touched his garment and they were healed. This is all in chapter 14 after Jesus had just gotten alone with his father. That's all that had happened. And we see all this miraculous. What would happen if we just kind of committed ourselves to saying, you know what, I'm going to get alone with the Father and I I just want to be amazed at what He's going to do in my life and through my life as a result of being alone with Him. Instead of having this mentality of, I'm going to go ask for this and this and this and this and this, I'm going to go and just be with my Father. I'm just going to go be alone with Him. And it all happened in Matthew chapter 14 by Jesus just being alone with His Father. So let's change the scene. We're going to go to another scene. We come to Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, Jesus appears again to be alone with his father. So let's look and see what happens in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says this. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. As he finished, one of the disciples came to him. So we understand that Jesus is off and Jesus finishes praying and a disciple approaches him and watch what happens. As the disciple comes to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Let me stop for there just a moment. It's the only time you'll see in scripture where the disciples actually ask Jesus to teach them anything. And the one thing they ask Jesus to teach him is how to pray. All the other conversations, a lot of them are, Jesus, why this? And why did you do that? And why did this happen? And how come this? This was teach us. The disciples saw something in Jesus about being alone with his father that they didn't, they couldn't have grasped and they were asking him, would you teach us what this is, what's happening here? And he says, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come soon. It's a clone prayer of Matthew chapter six. In other words, in in Matthew six, he's talking to the crowds Uh, by the Sea of Galilee on the Mount of Beatitudes. And here Jesus is simply alone and the disciple comes and he says, hey, teach us to pray. And he gives the same idea and it starts with our Father. There was something about that 
There was something more than just saying the words. There was something more than even just being alone. There was something significant about this. But watch this. The background of a disciple. Let me give you just kind of what the upbringing of a disciple looked like. At age five, every young boy, every young Jewish boy would go to rabbi school. And what they would do there is they would learn the text. And the only, the, bit, the, most, the majority of the text they learned was the Old Testament. That's, they studied it, they studied it, they studied it. And it's said that many boys, by the time they graduated or got to the age of 13, 14, had large portions, if not the entire Old Testament, memorized. They could quote Scripture backward, backward and forward. They knew it. And so this is the upbringing of a Jewish boy. Now, when I say that, how does that relate? Because here's the deal. Imagine from the age of 5 to 13 or 14, you are in the teaching and instruction of a rabbi. There would be lots of prayer that took place during that time. Rabbis would, would teach their disciples how to pray. They would teach them to pray. And then these disciples who were taken from that rabbi school now following Jesus come to him and say, teach us to pray? They had grown up in prayer. They had seen it multiple times by rabbis. They had, they had, they had experienced, but they, but they encountered something. They said, Jesus prays differently. What is it about that that he prays that makes a difference? Matter of fact, when we read from Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 6 to 15, so surrounding the Lord's prayer, when we read that, we see that Jesus used the word Father six different times in those verses. And one of the other things we see is, is that in John chapter 5, 18, we won't look at it, but John 5, 18, for those who are taking notes, we realize that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, actually tried to kill Jesus because he called God Father. What was it about that that would cause people to want to kill someone because he got, called God Father? In the summer of 1961, there was a couple named George and Helen, and George and Helen were dating, and they had a girlfriend and a guy friend who didn't know each other. And they, George and Helen thought, you know what, I bet you this guy and this girl over here, I bet you that they would make a good couple. Let's set them up on a blind date. And so they did. But before the blind date started, this guy comes to George and said, George, I'll bet you $5 that I can have sex with the woman you set me up with before the night's over. And so that night, this guy had sex with this girl, and nine months later, I was born. You're looking at the outcome of a $5 bet in California in a one-night stand between a guy and a girl on a blind date. When that man, biological father, found out that my 19-year-old mother was pregnant, he left. Didn't want anything to do with a single mom who was pregnant now at 19. So I've never seen my father, never knew anything. You know when you go to the doctors and they say, any history of? I go, I have no idea. I don't know. And, 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 and so I'd never seen a picture, didn't know anything about him. My mom only told me one thing, my name, Rod, that I was named after my father, Rodney Mel. And so that was on my birth certificate. And so then my mom got married a little while later and had my brother, then they got divorced. Then my mom got married a little while later and had my two sisters, and then they got divorced. And then my mom got married a little while later. So growing up, I've had four fathers. You know all the verses in the Bible talk about your forefathers? I know exactly what those verses mean. <laughs> my name changed from Mel to Simpson to Dugan to Whitlock. My first dad abandoned me. My second dad was, uh, after my mom and, and him had gotten divorced, was an undercover narcotics agent, would go into gangs, find out who was selling the drugs, bring the police in, and then go to another gang and do the same thing and work his way around that. One time somebody found out about that, he went and started his car, blew up, killed him instantly. My third dad was alcoholic abusive, so I'd come home from school and he'd be lay, or sitting on top of my mom, beating her with his fists, and, uh, and then my mom in between punches would say, go to the neighbor's house until he's done. My fourth dad, we lived in Phoenix, and I walked in um, to go to my room on the left, and I saw something, I looked over to the right, and there was my dad in bed with the neighbor lady from across the street. So growing up as a young boy, I saw a dad who abandoned me. I saw a dad who was assassinated. I saw a dad who was alcoholic abusive. I saw a dad who committed adultery. 
And sometimes people will say to me, how can you trust God as a father when that's been your example here on earth? I say, oh, that's easy. Because my Father in Heaven has never abandoned me. He's still alive today. He's been faithful all these years, and He's not abusive in any way. That's the Father that I serve. And let me just throw this in. My mom, I love my mom. I mean, she's passed, but I love my mom because she was the only one who stayed with me. And I know there was a lot of stuff there. I get it. A lot of dysfunction, a lot of stuff. And I'm not here to compare war stories with anybody because some of you, after the first service, there was a handful of people came up to me sharing their story, and, and some of it was a lot worse, and I get it. So I'm not here to compare stories with anybody. I'm just here to share with you that what I see in Scripture has impacted my life because of my story, and that's the meaning of Scripture in our lives, is to impact us because of, our, because of our story, to match our story with God's story and what He's trying to do in our lives, and bring us to a point where we find purpose and meaning and value and identity in life to be able to fulfill the mission of the kingdom of God. And so, so here's the idea. What's the thing that Jesus is trying to communicate? Let's look at it. Number one, for those of you who are taking notes, prayer with the Father is about relationship. It's about relationship. Notice he says, our Father. Immediately, he starts off by not just God, wherever you are, I hope you're listening, but Father. There's relationship there. You see, you've got to understand that, again, the disciples were well-versed in the Old Testament. They would know the story of the Exodus when God delivered the people out from slavery and brought them into the promised land. Matter of fact, you go read through the Old Testament, you'll see that story repeated more than any other story. That was huge, and the disciples would have known that story forward and backward. And so the idea is, is that they, they heard the account of God leading the Jewish nation by, by a cloud during the day and fire at night. They, they knew the power of God. Hang with me. And no disciple would ever question whether there was a God or not. They'd heard stories, generation after generation after generation. They'd heard stories of the power of God and who God was and what he had done and all of those things. So what would cause a disciple to ask Jesus about prayer if they knew the power of God? See, I hear people sometimes will say, you know, God's powerful, and he is. I'm not, I'm not questioning that in any, any capacity. He is powerful. But we stop there many times. And what happens is, is that we've made our prayer time with God simply a, a vending machine where we put in our coin, push a couple buttons, and something drops, to, something for our needs to be met, and we pull out because he's powerful. But let's not forget he's a father who wants relationship with us. He's a real father. It's about relationship. So, another scene change. Let me take you to the garden back in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Remember when God walked with Adam and Eve. In the cool of the evening, God would walk with them, and they'd spend time, and there was relationship there. And, and then Adam and Eve sinned, and they blew it, and then they hid themselves, and God the Father searched for them. Where are you? I want to be with you. But they, in shame and guilt, were hiding from God. You see, you've got to understand this, that God the Father wants relationship, intimate relationship. So watch how the enemy crafted this lie. Watch this. When Eve was tempted by the serpent, the serpent referred to God as Elohim, God. Did God really say you can't do that? He called him by his title. I want you to also notice that the serpent never questioned the existence of God. He never questioned the power of God. What was he questioning? Watch this. The serpent referred to God as Elohim. In other words, he used the title rather than the name God gave himself, Yahweh Elohim. Let me give you a practical example of that. Suppose that Kim is in the house and John, Pastor John, comes in the house from outside and he comes in and Kim yells, Husband! Title, no relationship there. Husband, I, I've got 43 things to do on the to-do list for you. You know, he says, no, today's Father's Day. I ain't touching it, right? Husband, when she calls him by a title, there's no relationship. 
Instead of saying, you know, like Babelicious, Snuggle Bunny, Love Muffin, whatever it might be, right? I don't know what goes on in that house. But anyway, my point being that the enemy used the title rather than the name. Why was he doing that? The serpent's aim? To remove any intimate connection between Yahweh and his creation. To take away any aspect of relationship between the two. The serpent didn't question the reality of God, only that you could have a relationship with God. A personal, life-giving relationship with God in that way. And this is why when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, in both instances, Matthew 6, Luke 11, he starts off, Our Father. Prayer is a relationship with your Father. Number two, prayer with the Father affirms our identity. When we lose the perspective that God is our Father, we lose the sense that we're His son or daughter. If we don't know who our Father is, then there's a loss of identity. And isn't it interesting that in our world today, there, I mean, think about all the people who are searching for their identities because they don't know who their father is. They don't know who they are. They've lost track of, am I, who am I? What am I here for? What's, the, what's my purpose? Where's the relationship? And this is why when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them, he begins with our father because there's an identity issue there. Father, ah, I must be a son. I must be his daughter. You see, we really can't truly walk in our identity as followers or fulfill our purpose until we know we have a Father who both loves us and is here with us. You see, I hear a lot of times people say, God's got a purpose for your life. God's got a purpose for your life, and he does. Again, I'm not negating that. But if that's all we think about, that God has a purpose for my life without any relational aspect there, then all it is is a job. But when we come and we say, no, I have a father who loves me and cares for me and wants to be my father, and he has an identity, there's an identity there, and then he has a purpose that changes the ballgame. Matter of fact, look at Jeremiah, Old Testament, Jeremiah 3, 19. It says this, I thought to myself, stop for just a minute. This is God speaking. And now, now think about this for just a moment. When, you sit, when you're thinking to yourself, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of thinking. There's a lot of words. There's a lot of exchange going on when you're thinking to yourself about certain things. God is saying this. He says, I thought to myself, I would love to treat you, Israel, as my own children. I wanted nothing more than to give you this beautiful land, promised land, the finest possession in the world. I look forward to your calling me Father, and I wanted you to never turn from me. Can you hear the cry of God's heart? Can you hear the cry where he says, I wanted to be your father. I want you to be my children. I wanted to give you the best, but you've forgotten the relational aspect of what this thing is all about. I have something for you. No other God refers to himself as Father. They all refer to themselves as God or a name of some type. Some struggle with this idea of a loving Father. Why do you think that the enemy works so hard to destroy the family? If he can break apart the family, he can break apart any relational aspects that we would have with each other or with our Father. Why do you think that the enemy works so hard to, to destroy men and, father and fathers? Because he knows if he takes the father out of the house, things happen. Do you know that most of the kids in sex trafficking, most of the kids in prison, people in prison, most of the people that are homeless, most of the people who are on drugs or alcohol, most of the people, this, we could go down the list, most of them, I'm talking 80, 90% fatherless homes. The idea is, is that the enemy is doing everything he can to destroy the home, destroy the family, destroy fathers. Can I just separate myself for a minute just from the preacher or just from the minister or just from the guest speaker? Can I just be a dad just for a moment? And let me, if I could, just let me talk to all the dads in the room. I want you to understand the incredible influence that you have I want you to understand what 
that your words and your, your, your appropriate touch and your, your being there present, I want you to understand what that means for a young boy or a young girl, for a teenager. I want you to understand that, that, that there's influence that you have, that there's, that there's not, just, not just being able to, you have, you have relational value in the life of someone. And, and, and you may not have kids or you may not yet be a dad or maybe your kids are all grown like mine, but, but you can still take the life of a child here at church or, or, or as you see them in the halls and just bring value to them as a dad. You can just speak into their life. You can just, and so can I challenge you as dads? It's never too late. And you know what? You say, man, I've made some mistakes with my son or daughter. I have too. No one's perfect. I've had to go back to my kids at times and say, would you forgive me for this? Let's make it right. You have influence. I'm challenging you dads to be courageous with that influence. If ever there was a time, if ever there was a time in our world today that we needed men to stand and be a man, it's now. And that's not to take anything away from women. That's not my point. I'm just challenging the dads and the men in the room. You see, the moment we forget our Father knows us and loves us is the exact moment in our lives that we begin to unravel, that our families begin to unravel. We lose hope. We question our faith. We have doubts beyond. You ever ask God what He wants? He wants a family. That's how we started, was with a family. Number three, he says prayer is about a family. He starts off our Father. I want you to go back and look at this prayer later, but it starts off, look at the wording Jesus Jesus uses in the Lord's Prayer. He says our, us, our, us, our, we, our, us, us. It's not me, mine, I, me, I, me. It's our, us, we. In other words, we're a family. He, he's praying. He's teaching them how to pray more than just the father aspect. He's teaching the family element of that. We're not just a bunch of people who go to the same church on a Sunday. We're a family. We're a family who's meant to come together with, with, with relationship because you're my brother, you're my sister. It's more than just a title. It's got to be more than just a title. Remember, titles, that there's no intimacy in a title. It's about pure relationship. And our relationship with God was never be, watch this, and I know you don't know me, but hang with me for just a moment. Our relationship with God was never meant to be personal. I know we have this idea of personal relationship with Jesus. It's my relationship, leave me alone, don't touch me, don't ask me anything about it. It's my personal relationship. I don't see that when God says, our, us, our, we, our, us. And yet some of us read the Bible this way. We read it, oh, that's for me, that's for me, that's for me, that's for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to all of of my. What if we started reading the Bible and started treating each other like a family more? Would we say, wait a minute, because Paul is writing to an entire church. My God shall supply all our needs. My God shall help all us together, my brothers and sisters. What if we went to prayer and it was more than just about, God, I need you to do these 10 things today. What if it was, God, I need you to do these things, but I also know there's people, my brothers and sisters in the church who are in need here, and then there's people in my community that I've been trying to share my faith with, and I want you to begin to do this, and and I want to pray for those relatives and friends of mine who don't yet know you that they're a brother or sister of mine, and I want to pray for them, and I want to begin to include the family in my prayers. I want to make this more than just about me. You see, the whole idea of a personal relationship with Jesus, it didn't start until the 1960s, the selfish generation where everybody grew up and saying it's all about me and my movement and free this and free that. And I, that's when personal relationships showed up. Before that, there was a body, family element to it. And God says, you know what? Would you be a family? You see, when I make my relationship with God is our rather than personal, my perspective changes. I see you differently. I see you differently. I see you differently. And I want to come alongside in a different way rather than just pass by. This Christmas, last Christmas, we have, um, at the time we had eight grandkids. All of our four kids are married, so there was um, 16 of them, my wife and I, all in our home for Christmas for a week. 
And there was some conflicts there. There was some kids beating up other kids and cousins, you know, how they get in. And then there was our kids beating up their kids. You know, I mean, it was just like, it got crazy, right? I mean, it was just like all over the world. I mean, you know, you have eight kids and eight, well, you had 16 kids and two adults, uh, my wife and I. But, you know, it just got crazy, right? Conflict, right? Joy to the world, huh? Right? I mean, you know. But you know what? We worked through those. We worked through those conflicts. We didn't just get up and leave. We worked through those conflicts because that's what a family does. And that's what I'm challenging you to do. What would happen in this church and in this community if people looked at this place as a place for family? Not just a title, but a real place. Number four, we'll finish with this. Prayer is a declaration of his name. Matthew 6, 9, the second part says, May your name be kept holy. See, again, sometimes we just read through these verses and we don't really stop and just ask the question. May your name be kept holy. Think about this. Go back and look at some of the worship songs. How many times they say the word name in there? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. There's something about it's relational. It's not a title. May your name be kept holy in my life, in our lives, in our lives. May your will be done in this place and outside these walls. May your kingdom come in this place and outside this place. Forgive us our sin. That we forgive others. What would happen? Genesis 4, 26. We'll finish, we'll wrap up. Genesis 4, 26. Look at this. When Seth grew up. Now let me stop you there. Adam and Eve, for those who aren't familiar with the story, Adam and Eve had three sons, Cain, Abel, and then Seth. So here we see Seth's name popped up. When Seth grew up, he had a son, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people first began to worship the Lord, Yahweh, by name. It's an interesting verse. Most of it just passed by. I can imagine it this way. I can see Grandpa Adam and Father Seth and Enosh, the grandson. They're sitting around the fire one night. And Enosh goes, Grandpa Adam, Tell me the story again about when you and grandma were in the garden. Oh, it was amazing. It was, it was, spect- it was, be- I don't even have words. I mean, we could go right up to the animals, the trees, the flowers, the sky, the birds, it's so colorful, everything. We, we would spend our evenings walking with God. It was incredible. And then we blew it. We lost that intimate connection. I can, I can just see Enosh sitting there listening to his grandpa, hearing the story. And something on the inside said, I'm going to bring worship back to the name, Yahweh Elohim. I'm going to bring worship back to the Father. At that time, people first began to worship the Lord by name. So George and Helen, the ones that were dating, well, they got married. My parents and family are in England. My dad was military. I'm attending school in Nebraska, university there. And it was about an hour's drive from the university to the church that I was attending as a, when I was in high school. And my mom said, hey, we've got some friends in Omaha that you could stay with on the weekends when you go to church. It was George and Helen. Now, you got to understand this. My mom did not tell me that uh, my mom and dad weren't, the $5 bet, I, she, didn't, she didn't tell me that. She didn't know anything. You know, they, she told me they were married. And so I'm sitting on the steps one day. This is how cool God is. I'm standing on the steps one day with George, and George says, hey, I want to tell you a story. 
about a $5 bet that was made. I didn't know that story. And he tells me the story, and then he says this. He says, and you look just like your father. Well, I'd never seen a picture of my dad. Didn't know anything. Immediately, I jumped up, and I ran into the bathroom, and I looked into the mirror. For the first time in my life, I saw a picture of my dad. And it was at that point in my life that I realized just how good-looking he really was. I'm not sure why you're laughing right now. Do you know what? You look just like your father. I get it. Not physically, I get it. But you look just like your father. I, uh, from the time I started kindergarten until the time I graduated high school, the times I can remember, we moved 18 times. Different states, different houses. We were either running from a dad, running to a dad, running military transfers. All I mean, we moved a lot. And every time we would move, it seemed like I would be introduced in the middle of the school year. To, and the teacher would bring me to the front of the class or whatever. Students, we got a new, or, you know, we got a new student here. His name is Rodney Michael, whatever my last name was at that point. I hated it. Because I could see the people snickering or the people pointing fingers or people not caring or whatever. It just, I hated it. And every time we moved, I knew that was coming. Today, and I don't say this to my benefit or my whatever, I don't even know the word, but I've traveled all over the world speaking. And every time I go to speak somewhere, I'm always introduced as the new guy that nobody knows and I don't know anybody. God took what the enemy had meant to destroy a young boy's life and brought redemption to it. What the enemy meant by putting me in front of a class full of people that I didn't know and could care less about me and I hated that, suddenly I found myself in rooms full of people that I didn't know, but there was purpose and meaning by it because I have a father who loves me, who cares for me, and says, I want you to do this because I believe in you. And God wants to take your past story, whatever it is, and everyone in this room has a story. God wants to take your story and redeem it to a place where you find wholeness in the midst of what the enemy meant to damage. I want to challenge you with this as I finish up. In just a moment, we're going to invite the prayer team to come down to the front. Please don't miss this opportunity. Some of you may be in a situation where you have to forgive your dad. I get it. Will you just come down and say, hey, would you pray with me about this? Some of you may just want to come down to the front and just take a few moments by yourself and just say, I need to be alone with my Father in heaven. Before I leave, before the, the day gets crazy, I just want to come and just spend a couple of minutes and just say, Father, I just want to spend some time with you. Matter of fact, can I challenge you over the next weeks and months to just make that part of who you are? You say, Father, I'm not here to ask anything. I'm just here to be with you and listen. Some of you may just want to come and say, Father, thank you for pulling me out of the deep end of the pool when I was drowning. Acts 2.21 says this, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those of you who don't know Jesus, those of you saying, okay, that was... I, I, I kind of understand what you're talking about, this Father in Heaven, but I don't know Him. Father in Heaven sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross to forgive us of our sin so that we would know the Father. If you don't know that story, if you have never said, Jesus, make my life right with you, forgive me of my sin, I want to spend eternity with the Father. I want to spend eternity with you. I don't want to be separated from you. 
If you've not made that decision, today's an opportunity. You can come down, have someone pray with you. You can ask questions. Say, hey, talk to me more about this. If there's something stirring in your heart when I, when I mentioned this, can I just suggest that that's the Lord Jesus speaking to you, saying today's the day of salvation. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, everyone will be saved. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for my friends. I want to pray, God, that you would take these words that I've spoken, but more importantly, your word, and put them deep within our hearts and in our lives. Help us, Father, to, if, if we haven't heard anything else today, that we walk out knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you deeply love us, you deeply care for us, and you want us to be your children. I pray for those who need to extend forgiveness. I, I pray for those who don't know you, and today's the day that they say yes to you, and I pray for those who just say, Father, help me, remind me to spend time with you in any way. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Would you stand with me all over this room? And as you're standing, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come join me at the front. Some of them will be at the back as well. I will be dismissed here in just a minute, but if you can hold steady with me, that'd be fantastic. Pastor Rod shared a, the, the, just an incredible story of what I believe the Father heart of God is. And he would reach into that deep end where you may find yourself and pull you out. And um, he can make what you feel and seems like a mess into an incredible masterpiece. And he's done that with so many of us in, that are in this room that, well, we've got stories. I'm so glad that God loves us exactly the way we are. And yet he loves us way too much to let us stay that way. He's got a plan for our future. And, uh, and that's just to show his father heart. So some of you, when Pastor Rod was saying that a minute ago, that he said, you know what, I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart. I want to begin that relationship. We would love to pray together with you. It's the most beautiful thing we can ever do is say, welcome home. And that's not just about a physical space. It's about saying, welcome to the family as a brother and a sister in the Lord. And so if you feel like the Lord's drawing you to that position, we would love to pray together with you. We also believe as a church that, that there are times when there's, there's hurt, there's times when there's, there's a need in our life, and, and the Bible is very clear in James. It tells us that we're to call for the elders of the church, those that have their, their faith that we can connect with, and that the prayer of faith will save the sick. And it's an incredible encouragement to us, but it's also a directive to us not to carry those burdens alone. Not to think, I've got this. I can manage. I can do it. God gives us each other to help walk through those, those things in life that uh, they are a little bit tough. We get it. And you've got men and women that are available to say, hey, we just want to join our hearts together with you and pray. So I want to encourage you. Um, if you want to ask Jesus to come into your heart, we would love to do that. Uh, pray together with you today. It's just a simple matter of, of posturing your heart to say, God, I know that my relationship with you is not what it needs to be. There's sin in my life. It's separated me from you. And I accept your forgiveness that you offer to me through your son, Jesus. And uh, it's the only way we can be reconciled. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. I'm thankful that I have a Father God who provides um, the way for that relationship to be restored. So um, we should be grateful for that. And if you haven't ever uh, accepted that, we would love to pray together with you. Dads, um, probably the greatest, not probably, the greatest gift you could ever give your family is an example of a man who is also a son of God that would just lead their family. So thank you, men, men of God that are in this room for leading your families. You may want to pray together with your family over lunch and just, just have that moment of prayer and be a great time for you to, to pray for your family. I encourage you to do that as well. On your way out today, before you uh, head to the parking lot and all that, you'll notice some signs in the, in the foyers. It's, uh, there's a little sign that says, Grab a car, change a life. Why is that important? Because I believe there are men and women that we come in contact with every day in different settings that we're in that just need an ask. They just need an invite to say, hey, I'm part of a family. You should, 
you should consider coming and, and joining this family of, of God. And so we just want to equip you with a, a little card, just a simple little card that gives some information that you that we could just create an invite culture. It may be the tool that God allows for you to, to use as a, an introduction to a conversation. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about an invite culture. Invite people to talk with you, to walk with you, and then to worship with you. So just uh, take advantage of that, and that would be great as well. I love you. I'm so excited to see what God does in and through our lives as we recognize his father heart for us. So I want to just bless you. But after we do that, feel free to come and let us pray together uh, with you and for you. I believe God hears those prayers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and your coming and your going. And may you continue to be a reflection of God's grace in your families and in this community and all over the triad and those places that you have influence. God bless you. You are dismissed. We'd love to pray together with you. If I haven't had a chance to meet, I forgot to say this. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my wife and I will be out here in the West Lobby as well as Pastor Rod and the books. Make yourselves available to those. It'd be great. I'd love to meet you if you're a guest with us today. You know, please give us that opportunity. Thank you. God bless you. Have a fantastic day. Come and spend some time in prayer. We'd love to pray together with you as well. God bless you.